Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it It would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real genius. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. Um, I guess today is uh, my favorite insurance agent. I work with them on many, many policies. Uh, his name is Grant Johnson. Uh, he's a principal at Varde Insurance, V-A-R-D-E. So I wanted to interview him and uh, get some of the knowledge that I've learned from working with him to help other people, whether they're in real estate or uh, in business. Uh, you know, there's a lot of nuances of insurance. I've discovered some the hard way that I think will be helpful for people to know about. So welcome, Grant. Thanks for coming. Hey, well, thanks for having me. And I really uh, enjoy the, the ring of that, of my favorite insurance. I appreciate that. <laughs> oh, no problem. Well, I've worked with, with different insurance agents, and a lot of them, they just sell you the policy, and then that's it. You never hear from them. Um, you know, but you've been great with questions, and, uh, you know, you've been tolerant to be calling and asking about all kinds of situations, and uh, so I, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. So we, do, we deal a lot with uh, insurance on properties, you know, uh, rentals and things like that. So I wanted to ask you first, um, when it comes to insurance on homes and rental properties and things, um, what are some of the things that people should look for? So let's say they're, uh, they're an investor and they buy a property and at first it's vacant and they're going to fix it up and they're going to put renters in it or they're going to sell it. What are some of the things that they would need to know about insurance beyond just get a policy and make sure in case it burns down, it's protected? Yeah. Uh, great question. I would I'd start the answer to that question and say the main thing to know, especially right now in the insurance market uh, around the nation, is that insurance is changing rapidly. Um, insurance has really changed the last two years. I'm sure you've felt that and many other investors and um, homeowners uh, have seen that. And so it's not um, the, the same kind of game that it used to be uh, uh, just a few years ago where um, insurance was pretty easy to access and to get a policy and insurance carriers were fairly easy to uh, just write a policy pretty quickly and, um, and get it done. They're now really looking at closer inspections of policies. Um, they're they're really narrowing down their market. Um, and this is almost every single insurance carrier in the nation. Uh, and so it's, it's a little bit more red tape to get a policy uh, for any type of property in the, around the nation. And so the couple of the key things to look for always in insurance, the newer, the property, the better typically, right? Because uh, in theory, the, the newer, the home, uh, the less the risk it might be. Um, if you have a home that's two or three years old, that's probably going to be less risk than a hundred year old. Uh, or yeah, and, and why, why is that? Is that because the code has changed or uh, the materials used have changed? So like no more asbestos. Like what's the reason for that? Yeah, everything you just mentioned and more. Um, there's, uh, you know, you have just natural wear and tear on the, everything within that home. You think about um, the main things in a home besides a weather event um, that could occur that would be a claim. Uh, it would be, you know, the, the HVAC system, um, something uh, catching fire, which is the, the code or not up to the latest code of wiring. It could be old wiring. Many insurance carriers are now restricting um, or not insuring 
homes that have certain type of uh, electric panels. And so if it is a, there's two or three different panels uh, that they will verify or check um, in different forms or fashions. And um, if it has those, they they don't want that property. They will not insure it. Um, mm. So you have to kind of look at a, a long laundry list. And many of these things, you know, if you look at it um, where we are now versus let's say two years ago, it's it makes sense. It makes business sense because if an insurance carrier is insuring a property, they're going to make sure kind of an audit of what exactly they're insuring. And all of these things, you know, like the, the electrical, the the roof or the age of the roof or the, you know, the how the roof is put on, uh, many several things you can consider are going to be factors if it's going to be risk or not high risk or, or if it's something that they don't want. Now, it's it makes business sense, but to the investor or to the homeowner or to the new investor or new homeowner especially, um, those things it's kind of bizarre, right? Because it causes individuals like me who are insurance agents providing that insurance or trying to set people up with insurance to ask more questions, to kind of uh, provide more hoops to jump through and well, um, something we've uh, never seen before. Yeah, Grant, why? Is it is it because of like hurricanes, the insurance industry is taking a hit and now they have to get the money back by being more careful? Like why the change the past two years? Yeah, uh, several things. The the biggest factor, um, and this is obviously every industry uh, since COVID, is is this inflation uh, post COVID. So um, all the inflation that occurred, um, the the cost of goods, the cost of parts, cost of replacement. You you, you have to think in insurance, they're repairing, replacing, rebuilding uh, a home or a vehicle, and the cost and parts and labor of all. Uh, increased and especially after um, the pandemic and you know t- towards the closing of 21 and 22 uh 2021 22 um, we started to see those costs increase drastically and so you know you look at just home insurance loan or uh investor insurance if you're looking at a property to insure a property in some areas it might have been around an average of 150 dollars a square foot to rebuild that property but in the height of inflation, we saw upwards of 190 to almost $200 a square foot to rebuild that same property due to inflation. And uh, it's gone back down a little bit uh, from that now. But but in the height of that, it was costing more to rebuild or repair, and which cost the insurance carriers uh, more money. And that's just one big uh, chunk of the cost of insurance and the rise of the cost of insurance and the uh, changes of insurance carriers to start, in a sense, cracking down on on what what they're doing and what risk they're looking at, um, really to kind of mitigate that risk and mitigate their costs as well. Yeah, um, I run into a couple of things. So I had a flood at a at a property, a water line that was feeding their refrigerator. I didn't realize until that happened. Oh, now I know why they care about the water lines of this side or the other because one one part of the house could destroy the entire house. Mm-hmm. Or there's no smoke detector and the whole thing could burn down or, you know, this could leak again and flood the house or mold could come and destroy the house or, you know, all kinds of stuff. I just didn't realize that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And the, the, you look at, you know, home insurance alone or uh, it's, there's so many factors that can go wrong that could cause. And like you mentioned, something as simple as water damage. Um, you have water damage on a second story that's usually going to affect multiple rooms. Um, you know, it gets in the walls and it's very expensive. Um, and then, you know, you look at the source, what caused that damage? Was it a, a pipe or a, um, a, a busted pipe? Was it a freeze or something? And so then it causes insurance carriers to start, like I said, auditing a little better or pre, um, inspecting and auditing what kind of pipes are in the home. What, you know, where have this, has this plumbing been? updated in the last 80 years or so. Um, and so that's some of the reasons why we're seeing um, a little bit more restrictions, a little bit more red tape, which again, make perfect business sense as a, if you look at insurance as a business, but it's a very uh, strange and new and frankly uh, annoying to a lot of clients because um, it's things with this red tape and these questions and processes that nobody's ever seen before in insurance or when they receive insurance. So what happens, I've always wondered into this, what happens if you live in a state or a city where, I'm just making these numbers up, um, it's $100 a square foot to rebuild a home, 
but um, you know the 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 insurance will cover uh, one hundred and fifty dollars a square foot versus. Um, I live in a place where if the home needs to be reconstructed. It would be three hundred dollars a square foot, but the insurance, for whatever reason, would only cover up to two hundred dollars a square foot. What would happen on those two scenarios? Well, you know, first off, the 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 property should be adequately insured um, because insurance is all about the rebuild cost. So um, sometimes it's not doesn't take the market value. Maybe, maybe I'm looking at a rebuild versus new or rebuild versus tear it down and start again. I'm, there's, there's just, I'm, I might not be expressing it right, but there's two situations. One's where it's more expensive to rebuild than to fix. And another one where it's, you know, cheaper to just tear everything down and start from scratch. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click on support us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. Yeah, yeah. Well, in, in those certain areas, sometimes it just depends on the insurance care and how they do things. Um, if, if let's say there was damage, fire damage, or something, sometimes you you can um, receive uh, amount of a check uh, to for that property. And some people do that, especially investors. Sometimes will receive that check and move on. Uh, they'll sell the land as is, or you know, bulldoze it or something, and you know, move on from that property. Other times. You know, they, they rebuild um, as best they can. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, I just wonder, is uh, have you seen certain places that you insure in where, again, the insurance is, uh, not the price of the insurance, but again, it's, uh, it would be cheaper to just scrape the house off if it got damaged enough and build it from scratch rather than refurbish it. Uh, are you talking about when you purchase or after a, a, a claim or something? Yeah, well, what, right, once a claim happens there's a fire there's flood damage whatever it is uh the house could go either way it could be just i don't know if there's such a thing as like totaling a house like you would a car or uh you know how is it looked at if you have so much damage that there's now a question of should we just tear the sucker down and rebuild from scratch or should we fix it as is? yeah it, yeah honestly sometimes that's the call from the insurance carrier um they're going to see how bad the damage is and and they do in a sense quote unquote total at the home or the property out um, because they're going to say this probably is not going to be able to be uh, repaired as is. it's going to have to be rebuilt. So they could have do help with that assessment and understanding what you're going to do or how you're going to do that and make that calculation of what the rebuild cost is going to be as when they adjust the property at the claim. Okay. What is it called when a house is considered totaled? Typically just total loss. They, I don't know if there's a specific term. Some company carriers might have specific terms for that, but you kind of see just a total loss of a home. And it's it's a little different than auto insurance. Auto has a specific number, uh, but most home carriers um, look at it as in, you know, are you going to repair this home or are you going to have to actually rebuild the home? Okay. And another thing that came up was the actual replacement value to you. So I think the scenario is, let's say I have a house that was built in 1920, and uh, I need to replace the plumbing or the electrical panel. Um, what, what do I need to do insurance-wise to make sure I can replace it? Because I remember we had a scenario like this where code had changed, and it would have been maybe more expensive to replace it up to code, but the insurance had a provision where if I didn't pay this for this premium or this rider or something, that it would have only covered it to fix it in the old way, which wouldn't be enough to fix it in the new way. Yeah, so uh, if I understand right, the the question would be, or the, the answer is you want to make sure that you have the building codes coverage on your property because if you do not have that, then the insurance company will not pay the cost to build up to code. And sometimes that is several thousand dollars, several tens of thousand dollars, depending on um, what needs to be done, what needs to be changed. Um, I'll give you a good example. There was a client that came to us with previous damage that was fixed and uh, she had told us a story that her previous insurance company 
did not provide building codes coverage uh, to her. Um, her, I believe, uh, relative was smoking in the garage and actually caught the garage on fire. And um, they got the fire out pretty quickly, but it had done significant damage, especially from the smoke. If you understand, you know, in a, in a garage, there's just a lot of smoke uh, inhalation from the fire itself. And so they had to rebuild and repair the garage portion and the entire amount of building codes coverage was $14,000. And since she didn't have that endorsement on the policy, she actually had to pay that out of pocket to be able to build it up to code. Yeah. The insurance would pay you to have it fixed as if it was what, 30, 40 years ago, but because code has changed it cost more to fix it, you know, the, the right way today. Is that why? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because it's more to fix it with those codes. And so if the endorsement's not there, then they will not pay for that. But the issue is that to rebuild it correctly, you usually have to have a licensed professional, whether it's plumbing, electrical, um, contractor, um, and they're, they have to build it up to code. So there lies the issue of, you know, you might get a, a total claim for $40,000, but you have to rebuild the section of the property for um, $60,000 because 10 of that has to be building codes, but that 10 has to come out of your pocket because you didn't have that building codes coverage. So will most insurance, I mean, you probably can't trust that every insurance agent will know about this. What should people say if they want to make sure it's addressed when they're getting a policy? What do they call it? Yeah, so it's usually two terms. It's either building codes coverage, which is pretty fairly known for most people, but other companies might call it ordinance or a law. And so if you, that's the same type of coverage, but it comes by different names depending on the insurance carrier. So building codes is pretty familiar for most agents and and that should be what people should ask about. And if they don't know, then you might look it up in that area or something. And I would hope your insurance professional uh, agent would know what that was. Um, or be able to look. Right. So definitely. So a, it's going to cost probably a little bit more for this endorsement, but if you don't get it, you have an older property, you're, you're looking for trouble. Exactly. Yep. Anything really over about 10 years, um, depending on the area, uh, you're going to really want to have building codes coverage on. Um, we have it as standard practice at our agency that we provide that for everybody, and then we discuss what that is and what um, why it's important to have it. It's usually... I, I hate giving out numbers because it's so different for every area, every state, but it is very, very uh, inexpensive when you look at the grand scheme of things. Um, it might be, let's say, for example, uh, $50 a year or possibly a, up to $100 a year to have that. Um, some carriers might be more. Let's say if it's $250 more, yes, that's $250 more, but um, you know, pay $250 a year. Uh, and to not have to pay fifteen thousand uh, dollars at a time of claim is is worth it for most people. Yeah. Okay. And then what about um, you know, I had to replace a roof, so they talked about it's depreciated value. Like, so let's say I buy a house and the roof's already uh, eight years old, and something happens, it leaks, and I need a roof replacement. What will these shirts try to do to get out of paying me to to actually fix the thing? Well, you know, that's becoming uh, an issue more and more now, especially as insurance carriers are, again, cracking down on things. You know, we, we work in Oklahoma, Kansas, and Texas primarily. Uh, we're located in Oklahoma, and Oklahoma is a different animal when it comes to insurance, for sure, for many reasons. And the roof is a big, big factor when it comes to insurance uh, in Oklahoma. And so it's different every state, um, and it's different So for, with some carriers. But the the thing that the that they're looking at that have changed is you know they're they're really cracking down on looking at um, the age of the roof, uh, especially in Oklahoma. Most carriers are predicating the the rate and certain coverages on the age of the roof. And so if um, in the past uh, you know agents and clients might guess or have an estimated guess on the age of the roof, but now they, they want a really close detail on that. It's kind of hard to have that because when you're buying a new property or a home, sometimes the buyers don't have that information or it's not passed, but they are going to look at several things of specifically the age of the roof and then the the materials of the roof. And you know the way that roofs work specifically and insurance adjustments or claims is they have a number 
of squares. Uh, it's usually a, a couple of feet by a couple of feet, and they count the health strike. So most carriers, if if it's going to be this type of coverage for wind and hell damage, say, then they're going to assess that for how many hell strikes is within this area, these specific squares. And, you know, if it's only two or three, they might not replace that roof at that time. And so that's one way that they won't do a claim. But there's there's several of the things they're kind of going towards is, you know, if what actually caused the damage. One thing you have to look at, especially, you know, in the Midwest is, you know, we kind of experience a lot of things weather-wise. You know, we see really hot heat. You know, weather gets up to 110 degrees in the summers and in the winters we have freezing weather we have rain sleet snow and so it does a number on those roofs and so if uh the roof has any type of weather related patterns on it that's not wind or hell identified then they might not file the claim so an example of that is some roofs are really predicated by the way that they kind of breathe So insulation is key for roofs, especially in the Midwest. And so if that roof is not properly insulated, you have a lot of heat rising and that heat gets into the roof. Let's say it's a architectural shingle or a composite shingle roof is usually what's called. Those those shingles tend to wear out. They expand and contract and it might create bubbles in that roof eventually. And if that bubble pops then that is not considered hell damage. That's considered natural wear and tear. And most insurance carriers do not cover natural wear and tear. And so those are things you have to look at and and be mindful of that, you know, it's, it's strictly, depending on the coverage and carrier, it's wind or hell damage. The interesting thing is wind is really kind of hard to claim and it's getting harder now because it's pretty hard to justify or prove wind, true wind damage. Sometimes it's just an old shingle or shingles that fall off or rip off. And then so uh, wind damage is a little more difficult to prove than something like hell damage where you can provide, or you can prove hell strikes within areas. And then, you know, they obviously go around the property too. They can look at the fence. They can look at the gutters to see if there's other hell strikes around and makes a kind of obvious case that, yeah, there's a lot of hell everywhere. And there's obviously hell at this property and it has damaged the integrity of the roof and is, needs to be replaced. So that's one thing. And the other major thing that can be a problem for roofs but won't be covered by insurance companies is, again, the natural wear and tear or the actual roof manufacturer defect. That's becoming a little bit more of a problem because especially you know where we're at located in central Oklahoma, We have a lot of roofs that are getting older. We haven't had really significant hell damage in some areas and the roofs are older, but there might be some damage, but they can't prove that the damage was wind or hell related. And it might be just a defect from the manufacturer. But unfortunately, those types of defects are not covered by your insurance. So that's where you look into a specific warranty from the manufacturer when you put a new roof on. And we try to educate our clients, those things that's very important to have the warranty, especially when you put a new roof on to make sure that you have the warranty or that you get a warranty in case it's something related that's non-weather or wind and hell related. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess you can screw up your coverage. Let's say you have uh, an addition put on and it's not permitted or you have someone that's not a licensed contractor do work. Could that compromise your ability to get an insurance claim if something happens later? It possibly could that they do want to look at licensed uh, professionals, but you know, depending on the area and again, each carrier might be different on how they inspect or audit or adjust claims. A lot of times they're, they're not going to right now, they're not going to go back to look at, was it a licensed professional? But I will say, especially being in a very prominent roofing state that it, it kind of goes hand in hand. The, the more licensed contractor roofers, for example, tend to do better work than the people who might not be fully licensed or, you know, we call them fly by nighters that when there's a hell storm, they're knocking on doors, they're cold calling you 15 times a day, those types of things. And the work might not be the best. And the the main thing with those types of quote unquote roofers is what are they putting on your roof? You know, they might quote you something less expensive, but are they putting on roofs 
their shingles that have been in a warehouse for three years, you know, or are they mix matching shingles or other things like that, but it might not be the best thing for your roof and the integrity and the, the longevity of the roof. Okay. So what happens if, um, again, if I buy a house, the roof's eight years old, a year later, hail comes down and, you know, obliterates the roof and I put in a claim and the insurance company says, oh, we're not going to give you everything because, you know, we're going to act as if you benefited from having a roof for eight years because it's, or nine years, now it's nine years old. Does that happen? So I think what you might be indicating is like actual cash value. Is that what yeah. you're referring to? Yeah, no, depreciation. For it. Yes. Yeah. So that is all dependent on a couple of factors on, again, most carriers, especially in the Midwest, look at the age of the roof and they predicate that full replacement cost versus actual cash value, which is depreciation on the age of the roof. So some companies look at anywhere from seven years to 10, 11, 14, 15 years. Um, and let's say if it's seven years or younger, they're going to have full replacement on the roof. And after seven years, it's going to go to actual cash value. Uh, for instance, not every company, some companies do full replacement for life. Other companies have those restrictions on the age, but if it is, so the policy would be, and the coverage of that at the time of claim would be dependent on the type of policy that the person has. So if it is one that is not full replacement, it's not 100% replacement, it's going to be actual cash value. Then it's going to be that predicated on how old the roof is and then how much the depreciation amount is going to be. So that means you would be paying your deductible plus the amount of depreciation. So for example, just to use numbers, if you have a 10-year-old roof and it is now actual cash value and you have a deductible that is $5,000, you're going to pay $5,000 for the deductible and then you're going to pay about 10 years of depreciation on that roof, which might be, depending on the size of the roof, might be anywhere, you know, another $5,000 or so. So at the end of the day, you're paying around $10,000 for the entire roof. That might be $30,000. Is there any way to avoid uh, paying back the depreciated amount? The only way to avoid that is to have a policy that is full replacement. And the only way to avoid that is to either have a policy that offers that or to have a newer roof that's under that amount. So, and like I said, some carriers do that full replacement for life. Other carriers have designated age changes when the roof is a certain age old then it changes over from full replacement to actual cash value. But yeah, once once it's it's there, there's no way to change that unless you get a new roof. It's, okay. it's all over. So what about again uh asking the beginning of the scenario? So let's say I buy a house and it you know needs work and it's vacant. Do I need a certain policy when it's vacant and a different one when I have contractors working in there and then maybe a still different one when I you know, let's say I put renters in there after that. Do I need to do anything with that policy as the house goes through these different stages? Yeah. It depends on a couple of things. There's several carriers that will not cover a vacant property. And so, you know, as the insurance professional, it's our job to ask those questions and make sure if the home is vacant or not to make sure they have the correct policy. Because if it's not covered, then you could either have issues where the, they're going to find that out because most companies now do inspections, which means they're going to have a representative drive to the property and look in the front yard or the backyard and assess the risk. And if they can tell that it's vacant, that nobody's living there, sometimes it's easier than not, but then they might flag that as a potential issue and either set to cancel it or non-renew the property. So, you know, if you, you want to make sure that you have the correct policy to start there. Now, if other companies are okay with that and you either designate how long it might be vacant and and you just you know go from there and then other policies are totally fine and don't care and they'll ensure kind of whatever so you want to make sure that you're you have the right policy for those things the the danger in having the wrong policy is like i said they might set to cancel or non-renew the policy but ultimately if you place insurance on property that is vacant where that policy says they don't cover vacant policies. Ultimately, the insurance carrier has the right not to fulfill a claim. So they they won't cover it because they see that as a technical fraud issue. You said, technically, you said it was not vacant and it is. So could be a problem there. But there are insurers that will insure vacant houses, like at least temporarily, right? Absolutely. Yep. That's right. Okay. What about when you put renters on a property I've heard some places require the renters have their own renters insurance. Like what are some of the uh, the problems that can happen if you have renters, they do something that, you know, leads to the property being damaged. 
their stuff stolen or who knows. Yeah, there's a couple of factors you want to consider when you have renters in a property that you own. You want to make sure that you have things, coverages that might make sense for you as an investor. So you're going to want to make sure that you have the specific liability coverages. You know, liability is the backbone of insurance property coverage, but you want to make sure you have adequate pro- liability because if something happens and, you know, let's say they the roof crashes in one day on the people living there, they're going to pursue that against you and that your liability pays for that. Um, other things that we see often are loss of use or loss of rent, it might be called. So if that property has, let's say, water damage or catches fire and you have to repair or rebuild that, people living in the home cannot live in the home at the time. So you as an investor are going to have to make up for the loss of rent that you might be not earning as they're not living in the house or the property. So the loss of rent is crucial to have as an investor. And then other coverages like malicious intent, things like that, you might see often where people living in the home might trash the house or, you know, spray beneath the building or, you know, rip out plumbing or something like that, that might cost significant damage to the property. And some carriers have that included in the policy. Others have that as an endorsement or a possible endorsement. So you want to make sure you have those types of coverages. And if that's a value of you to have yours to have as an investor, that if something like that did happen, either you're going to pay out of pocket for those damages, the malicious intent, or your insurance is going to cover that. What happens if, uh, you know, God forbid someone makes your house to a meth lab? What could you do there? Anything? Well, you know, that's from the insurance terminology, there's not a lot that you can do. That's going to be something. Well, let's say there could be liability on your end because you own the property and I'm sure there'd be investigations and things into you if you had anything aware of of any knowledge. And so if something happened like somebody, you know, got hurt, sick, died, from that, then it could come back on you as well, which is why you want to do things as an investor and a landlord of, you know, properly vetting people and things like that and having checkups or check-ins on properties. But yeah, it could fall back on your liability, but ultimately, you know, it would be either that or, you know, a civil case or something. Okay. Gotcha. Any other endorsements that are common that people need to know about or any other advice that I haven't asked you about? I think water backup. You mentioned earlier, water damage can happen. Most of the time, most insurance companies have already included any water damage in the home, under the home, on the property, if you will, that damages the property. But they're typically, most companies have a caveat to that, that they will not cover any water damage that is a result to a water backup or a a surge, whether that is it within a basement or within the property itself. So sometimes what we might see is the city system or the water system might have a surge and it creates a large pressure that releases into a home. It's kind of a backup and that water can surge out of the toilets, the sinks, the bathtubs. It can sometimes create breaks in pipes and things, which causes that water damage in the property. Other times we see the cause being something as simple as a tree root that grows into a pipeline that backs up that pipeline. And again, that's water backup. And so that backs up the system. Unfortunately, I don't know why, but it's usually the sewer system, right? Which is a very disgusting. And when we train new agents and teams in our agency, we, we always share that for whatever reason, it seems like this only happens when people go on vacation. Because it, for whatever reason, it happens that people leave for a couple of days or a week and they come back to find that this has happened. And when that happens, it's really unfortunate because that is literally, most of the time, sewage water from the backup in their house, which could destroy the furniture, you know, any belongings, the walls, the floors, carpets, you name it. And again, depends on where it happens and what happens if it's first story or second story, which makes it even a worse scenario. But having that coverage as an endorsement is crucial and be to have because if it's not covered, if you don't have that in water backup endorsement on, then again, you're out of pocket if it was something caused from a water backup issue. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I remember there's probably some movie where someone was sitting on a toilet and a vast amount of water came out of it, shot them up to the ceiling. <laughs> you know, it's just a silly movie that reminded me of that. Right, exactly. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, very good. I know we've stuck with uh, home insurance, but we've gone quite a while. So just tell us, there's, again, the states, the areas you cover, and how they get in touch, and the types of insurance that you can offer out of your agency. Yeah. So we're primarily out of Oklahoma, and uh, we serve Texas and Kansas as well. And uh, again, it's Varde Insurance Group. It's a V as in Victor, A-R-D-E. Varde is the Swedish word for value. And our goal is to provide value to people's insurance experience. So, you know, like you said earlier, everybody can provide insurance. Everybody can provide a quote, but we really hang our hat on providing value and education and consultation to individuals and great service throughout the process. And we are located on LinkedIn. We have a Facebook page. We're actually on TikTok and Instagram as well. And um, we're happy to help anyone that might need assistance and advisement or new insurance. And we do every type of insurance except health insurance right now. So we primarily do home, auto, everything between there, motorcycles, and small commercial and life insurance. Okay, excellent. Well, Grant, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.